It's, um, it's lovely to be in Canada, um, the country that my, most of my, my, my countrymen feel is just an extra bunch of states we should have taken back in the 1860s. <laughs> um, we, we've always blamed Abraham Lincoln for that, but you know, he had other things to do. Um, he talked seriously about invading Canada, and back in the 1863, there were only 38 Canadians, so we figured we could have taken it. Um, now that there are 50, it's a, it's a deeper and tougher proposition. Modern count, 65. So in Sorry. The, in the States, know. do you guys know, there's a thing in Canada, how many people here by a show of hands know that um, colonial men and Aboriginal soldiers went down to Washington and burnt the White House to the ground in 1812? That's our last victory that we celebrate. Yes? No? There's yeah, but, but I, see, I'm one of the rare Americans who knows about what the Plains of Abraham means. <laughs> Well, except, know, for fans, like, except for fans of the band. What's that? Except for fans of the band. I have the no band. idea what that band is. I'm, I'm, the music I listen to is all produced by men and women who've been dead for a long enough time that it don't, they don't matter anymore. There's a, there was a group called The Band in the 1960s oh, well, and course. 70s. No, the band is the... No, 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 no. Garth Hudson, Jamie Robbie Robertson, Richard Manuel, Rick Danko, and Levon Helm. I knew how the band are. So I thought you said there was a band called The Plains of Abraham. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. The band, the... There are, only, there are only three things that I continue to pay any attention to from my teenage years. That's the band Van Morrison and Ry Cooter. Yeah. Um, and I just recently rewatched the, uh, the, the Last Waltz because I was too fucked up in 1976 to get my shit together to go to, <laughs> go to, go to San Francisco to see the show because I, was, I spent most of the 1970s in a state of fucked uppery, you know? So don't judge me. And frankly, you can do all your, I don't really care if you judge me or not. I, I really don't care what you think. Um, there, there's a place on Main Street. What's that? There's a place on Dundas Street, Main Street, downtown London, yes. where we have the Music Hall of Fame. And in the window of the Music Hall of Fame, you can stand beside a life-size Johnny Cash cutout, hawking MasterCard. I want to stand inside a life-size Johnny Cash. Johnny, I don't want to stand alone. I want to be among it's Johnny Cash here. biogenetically. Oh. But beside that is, is photos of the members of the band. And I, all I think every day is the, the sad, tragic truth of how many young people walk by and have no idea who that is. Nothing. Much but less that, Johnny but that's Cash. All, I, mean, I mean, the only one that left alive, the Garth Hudson is still alive, and Jamie Robert Robertson. And I like Jamie Robert Robertson mostly because he is a combination of a Native American and a, and a member of the tribe. You know, he's a Jewish Native American which I really love. Do you know, do, because do, for me, as a, as a Jewish kid from Brooklyn, I always wanted to grow up to be a cowboy, not realizing how that, that was not a career option that was available to me at that point. <laughs> you know? Um, Unless you're in Hollywood. Well, I, I look really good in double-breasted bib front shirts. Ah. Oh, you know, as so that, many of us do. That, By the way, I am playing to this name right here, because the two of these names right here are the best audience I've had all day. There you I'm go. I'm getting big laughs. The rest there of you, you leave anytime you want. You know, it's okay. You guys, if you, if you leave, my, my feeling will be hurt. <laughs> I only have one left. One feeling left. It's a really good one. Where do you but keep I, it? What's that? Where do you keep it? In my pants. There where you all go. feelings there we belong. Go. So, Welcome to the show, ladies and so gentlemen. So I'm, I'm here. I mean, anybody who's... I mean, I'm assuming most of you are literally just using these chairs to rest your booties because you don't really give a shit about me. Um, <laughs> but my name is Howard Chaikin. I'm a working cartoonist and professional in the comic book business for 48 years. Out of those 48 years, I would say 38 are worth paying attention to. The, the, <laughs> the early 10, just absolute dreck. Complete and total worthless nonsense. And of course, the most commercial work I've ever done was done in that first 10-year period. But that says more about your taste than it says about my skill set. What would you okay? say was the point that you hit your mark, though? I feel I achieved, I became who I am in my early 30s after I was driven away from comic books by the then editor-in-chief at Marvel Comics, whose name will never be spoken by my lips in public. <laughs> um, and I went away and woodshed it for a couple of years and became the person I am today. Um, I did a book called American Flag, which was a dark comedy, uh, political satire, with a great deal of, of implicit sex and violence in the early 80s, which generated enthusiasm and attention for me, but never really achieved a, a huge fan audience because it was published by a small company.
but it's been an incredibly instrumental and, and an influential book in the mainstream comic books in the United States, although at least 80% of the people who buy all the comic books in the world have no idea that it exists. But uh, it exists in two it, volumes. It, it, was, it was very, it, 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 the people who read the book all became professionals in the 80s, 90s, and the early aughts. Uh, so that, that's where my bitterness lies. Um, and I try to avoid bitterness by, by reminding myself that nostalgia is bullshit and that living in the past is a waste of everybody's time and that my life is based on moving forward. At my age, I'm 68 years old, which I don't lie about thanks to fucking Wikipedia. And, um, you know, I can't even, you know, it just, it just they, they nail you to the cross of your own, own genetics. So at 68, I'm still competing with an audience that's a third my, for an audience that's a third of my age. I've aged out at Marvel and DC mostly because I'm older than most of the editors there as parents. <laughs> and nobody wants to yell at a person who reminds them of their mom or dad. I do, Maybe but they're. they don't. And um, so most of my work over the past oh, 10 years or so has been done for inter the independent comics companies, mostly at Image, who seem to uh, be willing to accept my, me as a, as, as a talent up there. Um, You've had a fair amount of revival work Bringing, bringing a lot of old franchise stuff yeah. back, though, as well. The Buck Rogers you did. Which, which, which was a lesson learned. It told me that I would never, ever do science fiction again because I just, I realized how much I hate science fiction. I hate the entire concept of fantasy and science fiction. I could be an audience for it, but I don't want to draw it. You know, <laughs> ray guns, blech. You know, it, I mean, I like drawing men hard, and women cool. in real clothing, um, having real relationships that are, more, that, are, that are identifiable to someone other than a 15-year-old virgin boy. That's mostly what comic books appeal to, you know. Boys, fifteen-year-old boys. Are with you no, identifying with that right 15 now? Fifteen-year-old boys with no life experience, <laughs> you know, and um, you know, like the guys who go to Star Wars all the time. Sorry, he's still. Oh, he's gone. It's okay. It's um, okay. I'm sorry, but it's true. I mean, I did a review of the new Star Wars movie, having never seen it, and will never see it. And the review it was called the Contemporary to Investigation Review. I never identified the movie, but what I said the movie has a great deal of acting and involves creases in the forehead that go horizontal and vertical, um, a lot of eyebrow acting, a lot of running with your hands held like spades, and no humor other than moronic chock block and not a single adult emotion identifiable by any, anyone older than 15. <laughs> and I stand by that review. <laughs> That's okay. a solid review. Um, you know, I mean, the most commercial thing I've ever done in my life was the Star Wars comic book. I was 25 years old when I drew it. I had no idea it was going to be this big a deal. Had I known it was going to be this big a deal, I'd like to think I would have done a better job, but I'm not sure I had the skills to do that. And, and, and it's been a toxic poison waste on my life for, since that time. Um, because it has nothing to do with my, my sensibility, my actual ethos, and my personal feelings about material. Now, Chris mentioned that I did a bunch of revivals. Rather than Buck Rogers, I'm more interested in the, in the work I did on The Shadow. The Shadow was incredible. And on Blackhawk. Um, yeah. which both, bo Blackhawk was the first comic book I ever stole. Um, by a show of hands, who of you has stolen comic books as a child? You're all, Nobody? well, you must be come Canadian. On. <laughs> you know, come I man on. Yeah. I manage you know, heroes' no comics and I'm putting No one's going to hold you up. responsible. We all did the four-finger fold, right? Remember, folding a comic book over this way and then again and sticking it down your pants. Who, who borrowed a comic me. from a friend and never it. returned so, it? It's I'm the not same judging thing. You. See? I knew, I knew the little blonde would know it. She, you know, yeah, there you yeah, go. Right? She's got there some go. in her wait, pants wait, wait now. Um, and of course, doing the shadow really pissed a lot of people off because I don't really care about the shadow. I'm not a pulp reader. I don't give a damn about this stuff. And, and, and it made Harlan Ellison's head explode, but he's dead and I'm not, so and, it's okay. And, and, yet, and yet, your shadow series was m the most identifiably recognized, organized story that I think that character has seen in comic book adaptations. It's because I have no interest in nostalgia. And I was really interested in finding a way to take a character who had born, I mean, let's face it, Lamont Cranston, if he was real, was born in, 19, in 1895, let's say. So a man born, an, an American born to white privilege in 1895 is not going to be a social political liberal in the streets of New York in 1985. Sorry. That, that He's going to be a racist, a sexist, a, a, a white supremacist. A, 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 rep, a living representative of white privilege. And, and, and that seemed like a character I was interested in writing and drawing. 
there's been a thing about comics going on right now for the past oh, most of my fucking life uh, <laughs> about likability, characters' likability. The last thing I care about in the character is his likability. My feeling is that my wife should be likable, my children should be likable, my grandchildren should be likable. Characters I read about should be interesting. Likability in a character is the kind of thing that comic book fans tend to seek out because they want, they're, 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 they're lacking something in their lives. They want to have someone they can aspire to, or more actually, a character who can behave in a likable way so they too can be criminals and nihilists. I prefer characters who are interesting. Um, the, 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 the material that I write, my villains and my heroes are functionally interchangeable because that's how the real world works. Is that, is that the old expression that every villain is a hero to someone else? That's right. You've yeah. heard me say it. Yeah. You know, I mean, when people talk, start telling me how crazy Hitler was, Hitler was not crazy. Hitler was a politician who knew his base, who identified that, how, how to manipulate his base and how to move his base. Okay? Had he won, every high school in the United States would be named out Adolf Hitler High. You know? So, let's face it, you know, history is written by the winners, and in the comic book world, you know, I outgrew the moral ethos of Superman when I was about 15. And if you look at Batman, Batman is about a, about a rich guy who had a bad day when he was eight. I call him a fetishistic fascist. Okay? And I don't really care about rich guys or their bad days. You know, if Batman were, were in the real world, he'd be the president of the United States today. <laughs> Not my president, but their president. Maybe he okay. is. What's that? Maybe he is. Maybe he has I a am, Look, I'm, this, this may come as a shock to some of you, but I'm a Democrat. Um, big D, small d. And, um, but at the same time, I find myself under personal and social assault from both sides of the political aisle. The crypto-Nazis, let's call them the Nazis, the American Nazis, now regard me as a... The phrase I heard last week was fantastic. I was referred to as a neutered butler of the SJWs. Not only neutered, but a butler. I can't even carry a fucking tray, you know, but, but a butler, okay? And by the same token, the left, many of the people on the left, regard me as an odious uh, demon in a human skin. That's a phrase. And that goes, recent, more re a couple of years back, I was called by the right a left-wing faggot. Is, so it's just, it's the best. Is this around the time when you did United, like as you were doing Say United, again? when you were doing United States of Hysteria. The Divided States of Divi Hysteria. I'm so sorry. I'm Get sorry. it right, man. Yeah, you know, I'm on crack. So, you know, I expect this from you, not from him, right? That's it. That's it. I'm fun, right? The lights, the, the glare, <laughs> the shine of you, it's throwing me off. All right, so in Divided States, there were some contentious articles people were taking. Both sides of the aisle are taking shots at you make it one determination of another. I read one article about calling you transphobic, which was, a, I don't know if you know, but uh, he's not. The, 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 the character, the, the, the transgender character in the book, had they actually read the book, <laughs> they would have noticed that she's the moral focus of the book, the conscience of the book, and ultimately the romantic lead when she and the hero fall in love. But no, the... The capacity for ignorant outrage is so fabulous and so profound that, you know, my feeling is these people should all die and taste their own blood. I'm not forgiving. <laughs> I'm sorry. One of the great things about not believing in God means I don't have to have that, that, that turn the other cheek. The cheek I turn is that my ass to you to kiss. That's just the way it works, <laughs> you know? The end. Thank you very much. Please, tip your waitress. We're here all week. So, so with an, with a, an approach to creation, so, Sorry? When you, so with your approach to creation, when you're working on your books, right. and you're putting together your material, and you're exploring and examining the direction of the characters, the authenticity of the characters, you don't get precious about the concern outside of your story. You're not worried about the way that people are perceiving it. You're following the direction of the story. Look, I mean, my audience is small. I mean, the metrics about comic books boils down to this, and this is not a joke, this is real. There are approximately 250,000 people in North America reading all the comics book produced in the States and, and in Canada and just North America, okay? Out of that 250,000 people, probably 35 or 40,000 have any idea I exist at all. 
And the rest, if they know me at all, know me as the guy who drew Star Wars when I was 26. So that 35, 40,000 people are my, are my only base. And, that, and those, they don't all buy books. Because one of the, well, look, one of the dirty secrets of, comp, of the paper business is how much pass around there is. It's a pass around culture, okay? Um, and I, I produce material, I've said it more than once, said it today, which is that I'm too weird for the mainstream and I'm too mainstream for the weird. <laughs> uh, the mainstream comic book reader has an almost dogmatic list of elements an ethos that must be met by a character. Likeability is one of them. The wounded hero is another. The, the very idea of the, of the hero's wound is, is intrinsic to the comic book reader's love of the material. There's, there's a tremendous community in comics that mistakes nice for good. And nice is bullshit. I am frequently referred to as a cynic, and I have to explain that rather I am a skeptic. I am a romantic realist. My wife regards me as a pessimist. I regard myself as a realist. <laughs> I have friends. And the reality is that a cynic is someone who tells you exactly what you want to hear while he is picking your pocket. I have no desire to go into your pocket because I'm pretty comfortable. I will tell you what, what you may not want to hear, and you can do with it as you will. I, I have a, some months back, I was solicited in this very passive aggressive way on Facebook by a guy who I don't know personally, but is one of my Facebook friends. You know, the concept of Facebook is so devalued, the concept of friendship, that, that friends no longer, I mean, I have, I have actual friends that people I eat with that I trust, you know, that, that regard me with occasional contempt because that's how people really interrelate. You know, I live in a small town and no one knows what I do for a living when they find out they're flabbergasted. They, they pay you for this shit? True, not a joke. It's very humbling and it's very humanizing. So this guy got on this, on, sent me this long post insisting, without insisting, but demanding without demanding that I denounce the people of Comics Gate. You were at Comics Gate? Is this, you the, this, is? Is okay. this the petition? No, no, it was not a, it was a, let's just say it was like, he was trying to shame me. It was slut, he was slut shaming me into getting down on these people. Okay. And unlike a lot of people who react immediately, I don't react at all. I said, I know nothing about this. Give me 24 hours and I'll respond. So I did my 24 hours of due diligence. I looked it up. I saw what these people were doing. The contention was that a number of the comics haters were my friends on Facebook. But as we both just agreed, I think we all agree, that Facebook has devalued the concept of friendship. Are you recording this or just taking a picture of me? I can't hear you because you're talking to me on your fucking phone. Why are you recording it? I'm so, I can't hear you. Okay. Just don't, don't get me arrested, all right? Um, <laughs> thank you. I'm, I, I'm grateful. Are you going to post this thing? I'd be grateful if you didn't because nobody's fucking business what we're talking about here even though I'm talking in a public venue. Okay, back, back, all right, whatever. So I read up and I read about what, was, what these people were saying and doing. And I responded by unfriending the number of people who were part of Comicsgate from my Facebook friends list. But I also explained that, I was, that exactly what was being said about these guys was precisely what was said about me last year by the progressive left, who didn't read my stuff, but drew conclusions based on assumptions, based on cultural amnesia, based on having no idea who I was, and based on presumptions. That if I had a, an, as ambiguous an image on the first issue of Hey Kids, of, of Divided States of Hysteria, of a woman wearing a niqab made of an American flag, that I, I, I chose that image on the basis of its ambiguity. But, like Catholics, comic book fans tend to presume that doubt is irrelevant. The, the imposition of a, of, a, of, a moral, of a moral belief system on other people is the first judgment of every comic book fan. 
which as we all know, if we're thinking about it, is rank bullshit. <laughs> and I, and I, in my response, I said explicitly that I cannot bring myself to join, to ally myself with a, with a coterie, with a cadre of people who had spoken about me at great length in this way last year, so I will not denounce. I also said explicitly, I pointed out to these people that most of the people who were Germans in 1933 were not Nazis. That they ended up becoming very satisfied with the rule of, of the Nazis for the next 12 years because basically it made their lives better. And that a lot of the people who were in the process right now of, of, of storming the barricades with their keyboards were going to be very self-satisfied and pleasantly, perfectly happy with the culture that was evolving in the States and we'd be, and be willing to denounce some of their former fellow travelers in the name of comfort. So I unfriended both the people who were, who were part of Comic Save, but also the people who asked me to denounce them. Because you, I have no desire to be part of a denunciation culture. It's bullshit. Back to you, Chet. So do you think that this polarizing attitude that both these sides are taking towards the material that people are producing without actually following through on the material right. is the, uh, a growing temperature oh, yeah. in the room? Well, or do I, you still I, feel I, I that mean, there's enough creative objectivity I people think are enjoying we, I mean, the work? I mean, you, hat girl, stand hat up girl. a second. How old are you? How old? Greg, you play much younger. Sit down now. Good. There is an entire culture, and I can't speak for Canada, but I speak for the United States, that has been born operating under the mistaken assumption that because the world was waiting for them, they were born knowing things. And the very idea, and, and it, it acts itself out in, the, in this concept of wokenness, woke, which, which implies a, a moral high ground that is contemporaneously chauvinistic. It's almost, I mean, is anybody familiar with, 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 with Voltaire's Candide? You know who Pangloss was? Dr. Pangloss. Dr. Pangloss was the, was the satiric conscience of Voltaire, whose phrase was, this the best of all possible worlds. And there's a contemporaneous chauvinism that posits the idea that, that Fukuyama was wrong, that that wasn't the end of history in 1989, this is the end of history now. That we have reached a point in our lives where the past can be judged by the present. Which is ridiculous. It's like the, the, the uh, use of the term postmodernism. What's that? The, the postmodernism viewpoint in no, a world I, I, where I think postmodernism as, as, as a, a form of criticism is, is perfectly fine, but it, it has to stop short of the idea that you cannot rewrite history unless you're, unless you're working for George or Orwell. Well, that's, yeah, the Orwellian. You know, those that you know, control I mean, the present control the past. Those that control the present. Right. Look, just, just as what makes Sammy run has evolved from a cautionary tale into a training manual in Hollywood, <laughs> 1984 has become a, a training manual for modern thinking on both sides of the aisle. Yeah. And, and I'm, you know, the, the idea of being, I mean, I love the word odious. I love the idea of being referred to as being odious because it, it makes me feel as if someone cares enough to use, to use a dictionary in my regard. So there you go. That's it for me. So fuck them all. <laughs> so so in, that, in that exploration during your process, in that exploration of character and story, what is it? Like what, what are you compelled by initially to create? What, aside from the exploration of relationship and, and character, when you approach a new project, is it something that's an idea that's stuck in your, in your craw, you've got to get at? No, it... I just, I mean, again, it goes back to doing interesting characters. I, I, I like genre material. I'm not a big fan of superhero comic books. I've never... My skill set has never connected with them. I can do perfectly f functional jobs in the service of that material, but as I said in, in, a, in a text some, some, some time back, I, my experience with, when I was writing superhero comic books, for example, I was frequently told by my editor, use their powers, and I kept forgetting to use their powers <laughs> because I don't care about that sort of stuff. You know, uh, I don't, it, it doesn't interest me. It's, um, what I care about is 
is characters yelling at each other, talking, about, talking with each other, and interrelating. And my job as a cartoonist is to create pictures that have narrative value, that are contextually share, sharing synergy with the text. And all the work I do, I mean, right now, I mean, I, 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 I've got the sequel to Divided States of Hysteria on my book plate coming in, in about six months. Right now, I'm finishing the fifth issue of the new book, which is called Hey Kids Comics, which is a bit of a departure for me. Uh, hey Kids Comics is a fictional history of the comic book business, and it's most reductive. It's Mad Men or the Deuce in the comic book business. And it's based on, I mean, as I say, I've been at this for 48 years, and unlike a lot of my colleagues and people who came after me, I come out of an apprenticeship. Uh, I stand on the shoulders of giants. I worked for Gil Kane, Wallace Wood, Gray Morrow, Neil Adams, and my rabbi at DC Comics was a guy named Joe Orlando, um, who basically taught me how to navigate the civilized world because I, I, I came to DC Comics tainted by my relationship with Gil Kane because DC Comics in those days was run by Carmine Infantino, who despised Gil, and it was mutually shared. They hated each other from the time they were kids. And Joe really had to teach me how to protect myself from Carmine's loathing of Gil, which would be directed at me. And these guys taught me how to be a man. They taught me to cut my hair, wear neckties, learn how to wear a sport coat, learn how to tie a necktie, and just behave. And they made, they made me who I am today, most particularly Gil Kane. And I've been listening, to, and, and, I, and I was surrounded by men who like to talk about their pasts. And, and I accept the fact that anecdotes are subjective. And I like subjective stories, because frankly, if someone's being objective, that's news. If someone's being subjective, it's gossip. And I love gossip. So a year and a half ago, two years ago, when I put out the call for the information for this book, I wanted anecdotes. And every single fucking thing I got was a score settler. <laughs> and it really pissed me off. Because it demonstrated the assumption that I was out to do a poison pen letter. And that was the last thing on my mind. I wanted to do something that was a love letter to this material because I believe earnestly, and we've had this conversation earlier today, yeah, yeah. that comics is a calling. Comics has more... In, cut that shit out. That... What did I say? That comics has more in common with the Jesuit priesthood than with anything else. I, I first became aware of the existence of comics at the age of four when I was given a box of... a refrigerator-sized box filled with comics that I fell in love with immediately. And at four, I recognized, A, that someone made these things, and B, I wanted to be that someone. And I had no talent, I had no skills, but I had anger, in show at rage, and, and just, and, and I was encouraged by desire. And unlike a lot of my colleagues, I had no skill set. I, I am the least talented and least naturally gifted of my generation, and I am, a, I am the living incarnation of the fact that one can learn how to do this. I learned how to do it by repetition, by practice, and by rote, and by being yelled at by better men than me. And yet there's a, a fantastic body of work that you have accomplished, and there is a fantastic appreciation of 48 years in the industry. You do a- 38, 40, 38. 10, 10 of them sucked. You, you do a wonderful thing with the covers. How many people have had a chance to see Hey Kids comics on the shelf? Because if you haven't, you got to check it out. One of the fantastic things about the covers of that book. Shall I tell you why those covers are the way they are? Please, it, explain the covers to people because the feet in front of the television set is, is, is on the wall in my studio. It's one of my favorite covers that have ever been made. When I set out to do the book, after I realized that I had to basically dig into my own files to find the narrative of the book. Has anybody seen the book? Okay, Jamie's good. Reading it. There Shame on you there. all. All you nostalgia-based junkies. Um, the first, it's a five-issue arc. The first arc is basically about the Silver Age of comics. It follows the adventures of three fictional characters, Ray Clark, Ted Whitman, and Benita Heindel, who are based on, they are all composites and avatars of actual people that I've known and loved and hated. Uh, there are only two gimmies in the book. A character named Bob Rose, who is immediately identifiable, and a character named Sid Mitchell, who is also immediately identifiable. Those are, the, those are the only direct avatars of real people. The rest are conflations. When I conceived of the book, I realized that there was no, this is not a book with punches thrown and slaps, and there's no, none of that. There's no action in this book. 
The book is about interaction of human beings. It takes place in four separate eras. It starts in 45, 55, 65, and 2001. And each 2001 sequence is, in, wraps around a memorial and a funeral, because people drop dead. We see them as young men and women, early middle age, late middle age, and old. And we watch their bitterness, bile, and, and satisfaction and acceptance evolve as they age. And I realized there was no image that I could put on a cover that would actually state what this book was about. So I ended up doing photo covers. And the work of a guy named Don Cameron, who was one of my favorite people in the world. I'm having lunch with him Monday. Um, and he's a digital cartoonist and a digital artist. So we created these, these visual gags in photo manipulation. Uh, the first issue is, is a guy showing up with a pile of comics at a convention with a, with a tagline and a balloon. The second is what, is what Chris is talking about, uh, of a guy watching uh, an interview with a, t with a TV, a, a filmmaker about a comic book being drawn by the guy on the table. It's just that sort of stuff. They're all photo manipulated. And I don't know whether it's helped or hurt the sales of the book, I couldn't say. Um, and we've done a couple of variants that reflect some of the imagery in the interior of the material. But I'm very proud of these covers. And, I, and, and it, it's because they, they really talk about exactly what the book is about. Because the book is about misunderstanding of your own value. Okay? Um, I, I really don't give a shit about superhero comic books or Star Wars or any of that stuff. Uh, I just don't. Um, but you refer to... Well, I, with these the, covers, books, the, the books book are about power, people who are making superhero comic books but, but and you, teenage comic books. But you, you take it a step even farther because you use a book, The Power, is it, what is the title? Power and the, Glory. The Power and the Glory. Yeah, Powerhouse. You, so well, I mean, you take your own book and make fun of. There's a whole line of fake comic <laughs> books in this book. with your own work. Okay. Um, the two comic companies are called Yankee and Verve. And there's... We have a whole line of comic books being produced by these guys. And we've got comic book pages, comic book covers um, that were done by another artist because I want to have a, very, a separation of, of the material. So buy the book, read the book. Third issue was, just came out about two weeks ago. The fourth issue will be out uh, second Wednesday, first or second Wednesday of October. Each issue is anecdotal. A lot of the story, it's true, anecdote, gossip in, in, in conflation and there is, there's no action there's very little sex but there's a lot of hostility but it gets into the heart of an industry that you've been negotiating for all of these years yes. and you do but the fact that you do so with a little self deprecation on your own covers I don't think so no, you don't. No, well, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, the, and, and, and the whole feed in front of the television, and there's a, a young creator on the TV. The famous guy with the famous new book is so, you know, what's your what's your secret for being so famous? And you got a word bubble going to the feet, or to the person who owns those feet. Says, yeah, I'd like to know too. I don't think there's anything. To, I mean, I. It's I mean, not that it's self-deprecating, but you example well, with your own work. I mean, it's for me. I mean, the book is about the Silver Age. So everybody involved is dead. You know, uh, we just buried Russ Heath a couple of months ago, and all the old guys are pretty much going. I mean, there are a couple of old guys still around, um, but most, most of, the men of, of the men of my father's generation are gone. If there is a second arc of Hey Kids, it's going to, take, it's going to be about a 20-year period, starting in 51 and ending in 71, which will make spiritual linkages between my generation and EC Comics. And that'll be problematic because those guys aren't dead. You know, and I'm going to have to really dance, do a real tap dance about hurting people's feelings. Because as Stephen Sondheim, the great musical, musical theater creator, uh, always says, always speak ill of the dead because you can't, hurt, they can't, you can't hurt their feelings and they can't defend themselves. And I'm a great believer in that. With, with all of the work that you've been doing over time, is there, here's, the, here's that question, is, is there pieces that you think you look back on and you're still good with what you've put out there? Absolutely. You wouldn't go back and change? No, the, the single, my, my favorite work of all my own work is Times Squared. Brilliant. Um, it's a very personal book. It's, it's oddly, it's sort of science fiction, but it's more a, a, a phantasmagorical point of view of a, night, of a little boy looking at the 1950s of New York. It takes place in what would be the underworld of the city of tomorrow as visualized in the 1939 
1940 World's Fair. It's the criminal element of that world. And I've got the third volume, which will finish the trilogy, next on my board. I'm writing it right now. The script is, is it's panel broken down. The dialogue is being written right now. Um, it's, it's pretty nutty. It's a sword and sorcery book for people who prefer crime fiction. Or something. Yeah, that works. And, they, and they, there's a lot of sex in that. Um, <laughs> but it's also, it's, it's about immortality, about eternal life, um, about zombies and robots, and um, all, all in, a, in a world that resembles nothing more than, than 42nd Street in Times Square circa 1955. But with a, with a book and with a series that ex explores relationships and explores sexuality in it, this isn't the, the I'm dressed in a, a leotard on a regular basis fighting crime, isn't that sexy implication sex. This is real relationship development and real people have sex. Real people have Except those moments in Star in the story. Wars. Except for in Star Wars. See, well, Star, Wars Darth Star Wars is about chastity to so profound a degree that I find it degenerate. And heavy breathing. No, there isn't even any heavy breathing. Except for Darth Vader. You know, I mean, I mean I, I'm the child of parents who's, who's, who, you know, were born in the 20s. And we all were raised, I mean, one of the, the na dynamics of media is that every generation knows that media lies about, its, about it. I mean, trust me. I mean, <laughs> some weeks back, I heard a woman of, of, of your age on, on NPR talking about the hippie movement. And I turned to my assistants and I said, huh? None of my generation called ourselves hippies. Those of us in our 60s, we called ourselves freaks or heads. But that we, so we know that Henry Luce lied about us. Time Magazine, NBC, everybody lied about us. And yet, at the same time, every generation, knowing that the media lies about it, takes for the gospel what that same media says about other generations. So I know that media lies about millennials. I know that media lies about the iGen. I know it, relies about, it lies about Generation X. And I know they're relying about my mother's generation because there was a lot of fucking going on back there. <laughs> they just don't like to talk about it. It's just like, you know, I found out five, five months after my mother died that my brothers both have different fathers than I do and the guy that I thought was my father wasn't. This, it's like, there's something going on back there with that, you know, so, so I just, you know, I, I take for granted that I am being lied to by everyone and everything. And it's worth doing research to find some truth, okay? Um, if, I mean, for example, like I said, I, I regard Star Wars chastity as kind of like off-putting and discomforting to me, you know? I'd like to see a grown man or woman you know, instead of sitting, like, instead of Harrison Ford and Carrie Fisher yelling at each other, referring to Kylo Ren as our son, our son, our son, so, so the audience should remember, oh, it's their son, you know, you know. I don't need that much exposition, you know. I took my grandsons to see that movie. My wife and I were sitting flanking the two boys who were loving it because it's basically the movie is the equivalent of setting fire to ant hills and pulling wings off flies. And my wife and I sat there, and as we got out of the movie, we both looked at each other, rolled our eyes, and said almost simultaneously, if only we brought our iPods, we could have listened to a book. <laughs> well, there's a great... I am the worst. It's it, it, like... See, and this is, this is what, what separates me from most of my colleagues, because most of my colleagues will, con will, will congratulate you for your tastes, for loving this shit. Not me. Get over it. No. Sorry. There's a Which is not to say that, I don't, that I'm telling you not to like it, because I don't really care what you like. I'm simply telling you that there are people out there who don't share your enthusiasms for this material, but work in the same field, doing work that's somewhat different. And that's me. Okay? There's a great opportunity at a show, like a con, or if you go into a fully rounded comic book store that doesn't just carry the leotard set, like they also carry the alternative set, they also carry books that explore even a uh, fantasy sci-fi element, there's, there's uh, dramatic pieces, there's so much material that's out there in comics. It's, it's a fine recommendation to be made, I think, to explore the avenues that are presented in, in a venue like this. If this is your taste of comic worlds outside of going to a box office and overpaying everything, 
popcorn, every other part of the experience, go to... He's crazy. I am, yeah, tall. No, no, tall I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm the guy, I'm much more of an audience for those popcorn movies than I am an audience for comic books. Those popcorns are fun, but if you're looking to expand your comic book experience, explore the bins. Don't, don't just... Right. Don't, Spider-Man. Spider-Man's great, but there's so much more. Look, I mean, I mean I'm, I don't read comic books anymore. I now derive the same pleasure from making comic books that I once did for reading them. And believe me, I told myself to read from comic books. I was reading on a, on a fourth grade level when I entered first grade because of comic books. Those of you who read Tarzan of the Apes know that Tarzan taught himself to read from the children's books that had been left behind by his murdered parents. I was that guy too. Yeah. I couldn't pronounce invulnerable, I couldn't pronounce indestructible, but I could parse it out and I knew what it meant on the bent of, the, of, the, of its relationship with the imagery. My mother died never having any understanding of the difference of, how, of the value of, the, of what comics brought to my life. Comics saved my life. And I say that with no irony. They taught me to read, they gave me a career, and they, they built in me an understanding of moral values which, which expanded ultimately into a wider understanding of how human beings behave and should behave. And I now derive the same pleasure from making comics that I once did from reading them. I'm a crossword puzzle guy. I do the New York Times crossword puzzle only Thursday through Sunday because the rest is for morons. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday is for imbeciles. It's like the TV guide puzzle for, for people with pretension. And, and comics are the, have the same, I, I have the relationship with comics of doing crossword puzzles, making cartography. Because comics are a visual map of narrative, okay? They are, we, comic book artists are not illustrators. Comic book writers would like you to believe that comic book artists are illustrators, but they are not, we are not. Comic book artists are graphic designers in the service of narrative. Our job is to, to translate a comic book writer's literary text into images with narrative value, okay? When I looked at comic books, the first thing I try to note is whether the characters in a panel are acting in a way that conveys imagery beyond the text and supportive of the text, okay? I taught a seminar at Marvel for six years where I try to explain that nothing in a comic book page should be accidental or ambivalent. There should be a confirmed reason why this panel goes before this one, why this panel is this size. Because in the context of comics, space represents time. The amount of space involved in a panel is directly related to the amount of time involved in the action depicted in that panel. One of the results of having no talent when I started my career is having to learn this shit and actually develop a working system to make it work. Now, I'm a terrible math student, but so much of my work is based on, based on mathematics, and, 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 among my, and, and the, work, the work I listen to as a, as a music fan I listen to Charlie Parker almost every day, and the only classical music, music composer that I have any real understanding of is Bach, both of whom are profoundly mathematic in their approach to their work. My work is deeply involved with geometry. One of the reasons that I can produce 25 to 30 pages a month, and that's a real month, not a comic book month. Comic book months have seven weeks, mine have four, that I, I approach my work not as a draftsman, but as a, but as a graphic designer and a, and, a use, and a user of geometry and creation of pictures. And that's getting a little bit too inside baseball, but you'll forgive me. On behalf of the city, thank you for sharing. As thank you, London. As you, can. you guys on have been great. The city, on behalf of the show, everybody, Howard is over I'm there. Over there. The the I'm over there. Come over there. Say so. hi. This continues. My Please feeling do. is, as I've said more than Please once, do. that the comic book, the convention I'm here is my client. You are my client's customers. I am here to be of service to you. I will engage and chat and perhaps annoy, but I, I guarantee you a fun visit. Come on by. Thank you for watching the Convention Junkies coverage of the 2018 London Comic Con. Please like, comment and subscribe to see more, and let us know below what you think of this video. If you would like to help us with future projects, please visit our Patreon page.